Good evening all, and welcome to this very special episode. Today, I present a masterpiece by Tobias Wade, and I'm very fortunate to be joined by the sensational nature's temper. It's time to find out what secrets the unmarked building in Colorado holds. So get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Four years in the army, and not once did I hear an order from anyone ranked above a major. Now, I've been at the Dalton power station for two months, and I've already received three phone calls from James Mattis, the US Secretary of Defense. It seemed like a mundane enough job, right? My stint in the army helped pay my way through a bachelor's in power plant technology after I got out. And I was ready for a reliable income with good honest work. I spent a few years in equipment operations, then checking readouts, and then on up to personnel supervisor. There's nothing more exciting than a few power lines being blown over in a storm. That is, of course, until I was promoted to plant operator in Dalton. You're going to notice a few anomalies with this plant. The old manager Nathan told me. He was retiring, although by the size of his waistline and the dull glassy glaze over his eyes, I'd guess he retired about ten years ago and just hadn't left. But I don't want you to worry. I've worked here 20 years, and nothing going on will interfere with your job. Looks normal enough to me, I replied. Was this some kind of test? Single open cycle gas turbines, probably around 140 megawatts, right? If I was expecting praise for my perception, I didn't get it. That was the first time I've ever seen a grown man spit on an office floor. Not about our output, boy. I mean our client. We're just supplying one building up in the hills. The rest of the city is handled by that hydroelectric station downtown. This had to be a test. It didn't seem fair, since they'd already offered me the job. But there was no harm in playing along. No, sir, that's impossible. This station should be able to supply around 140,000 homes. Or one government building, he grunted. Are we not producing at capacity? We are. Hell, they'd take more if they could get it. What are they doing up there? I don't understand. Nathan clapped me on the back, like I had just won an award. And they like to keep it that way. So if you want to stick around like I have, then you'll do what I did and keep your nose out of their business. Besides that, everything should run pretty smooth for you here. But Nathan was wrong. Right from the start, Nothing ran smoothly. First of all, the other plant workers acted mighty strange towards me. Every one of them kept their eyes locked on the floor, all wearing the same glassy-eyed complacency that I had seen in Nathan. They followed orders readily enough, but they did so without the slightest initiative or individuality. I caught one guy, Robert, chewing his pencil for ten minutes straight in the break room. I asked him what he was doing, and he mumbled that his schedule dictated a break every two hours. As soon as his ten minutes were up, and to the damn second I think, he stood up and left the room without another word. And then there was Mattis calling every few weeks. Those were the most awkward, forced conversations I've ever had to sit through in my life. Acting manager? Were always the first words out of his mouth. John Doe, speaking. Clearance code? I'd give it to him, and then he'd invariably ask me a string of the vaguest, imaginable questions. It almost felt like he was being held hostage, and had to speak in code to gather information. A few examples. Would you consider everything to be more or less ordinary than usual? Have you had any unusual request for output to anywhere besides that building? In an emergency, how fast could you shut down the power to everything if you had to? 
The financing is another thing that didn't make sense to me. Usually, a plant of this size will have a couple of dozen workers and needed its own financing department to keep track of everything. Here, we've just got Megan. There's not much to do really. There's no money coming in. I just prepare a folder every month with all our expenses, mail it to some office down in DC, and they take care of it. They never denied anything before. Three days ago, topped it all off, when I received the strangest question yet from Mattis. He asked if I'd noticed any of our employees trying to escape, like he was trying to clear his head and not his throat, and then corrected himself, asking if any of them were trying to quit or just not show up. The mystery was unbearable to me. But I was trained to follow orders, and despite everything, I could have maybe still accepted the situation, if it wasn't for the black van which came by two days ago. The so-called shuttle service. Although it was only picking up Robert and another technician named Elijah. I watched the van take them up the dirt road winding into the hills. Yesterday morning, they were back at work and I asked them what happened. But they both just laughed and said that they went out for a few drinks. Even the laugh felt wrong, like they weren't doing it because they thought it was funny, but rather made the sound in the hopes that I would find it funny and move on. The first thing I learnt about working in a power plant is that a pair of professional overalls and a condescending attitude can get you just about anywhere. All I had to do was strip one of the underground cables leading to the building file a report on the output fluctuation, schedule my own appointment, and show up. There was a guard post out front, but I showed them my diagnostics appointment, and they let me inside under escort, without complaint. I called it a building before, just because I'd only seen its location on a map. A mineshaft might describe the phenomenon more accurately, or perhaps a crater. The complex was clustered around an abyss, located at the bottom of an enormous valley, whose jagged slopes looked like the result of some cataclysmic primordial explosion, long since eroded and overgrown with spruce and pine. There was an unusual energy about the place, and I felt compelled to walk gently as though stepping atop a living creature. That was probably on the account of the constant vibrations, rippling through the ground, as though something deep below the earth was stirring. Most unsettling of all, perhaps, were the rows of black vans parked outside. Four of them were being loaded with long bags about the size and shape of a human body. I caught the eye of the guard accompanying me, and I noticed its glassy shine. Any power cuts have serious repercussions here. Please resolve the issue as humanly possible. Humanly? Maybe my discomfort had me imagining things, but somehow it seemed like he had said it in the same way you or I might say, he's pretty smart for a dog. The guard led me to a control station about a hundred feet away from the main complex. I couldn't get a good enough angle on the abyss to glimpse what would be down there, but up close, the vibrations resolved themselves into the distinct sound of drilling. I don't suppose I'm allowed to ask, I started. Won't do you any good, the guard answered promptly. I don't know any more than you, and that is already more than enough. Have you ever been inside? He shook his head glancing around nervously. Then, in a hushed whisper, I've never seen anything, but sometimes I'll hear things. Like something is down there that doesn't want to be. I raised my eyebrow, hoping he would continue. He opened his mouth, as if he were going to say more, and then he shook his head. None of my business, 
None of yours. How long is this going to take? I didn't push my luck by staying long. I traced the power restriction to the cable. I stripped and followed the black line away from the complex to the spot with the damage. I've been keeping an especially close eye on Robert and Elijah all day. I can't shake the feeling that they're not quite here. I caught Robert chewing on his pencil again, but he was doing it so absent-mindedly that by the end of his 10 minute break, he had eaten through the entire thing, graphite, eraser, and all. Elijah was even worse. He was microwaving a cup of noodles in the break room, anxiously pacing back and forth, like he was waiting for a bomb to go off. Then it beeped, and he actually collapsed to the floor in shock. I retrieved his glasses for him, and helped him to his feet, noticing his eyes were so pale, to be almost completely white. I'm positive they weren't like that before he went into the building. I searched through the computer's databases for any unusual mentions of the two, and found this log, written by Nathan dated two months before I arrived. Robert and Elijah's first pickup service today. Good for five rounds each before they used up. Current staff. Round zero, three. Round one, five. Round two, eleven. Round three, four. Round four, two. Round five, one. I'm the only one at round five. Requesting replacement for myself in two months after my final round. Suggest replacement exempt from rounds to preserve his functionality. May God have mercy on our souls. I scanned back further through his logs and saw a list of similar numbers. It seems like every week, another pair of people are sent to the building and their rounds are increased by one. Elijah was currently at four, whilst Robert was at three. There was also a schedule of future pickups. I scanned ahead a few pages, and didn't see my name anywhere. It was a relief at first, although the more I searched, the more unnerving it was to be the only one who wasn't on the list. Well, here goes nothing. I edited the next week to switch my name with Megan. She was around one. It seemed like people were returning from whatever was going on there. And I know I'm not going to rest easy until I get a good look inside. I don't know what happens past round five, but after trying to call Nathan's personal number, I'm pretty sure I don't want to know. I learned from his wife that he put a bullet in his brain the day he left the plant. If all goes well, I hope to get to the bottom of this before I reach that point. If not, well, as Nathan said, may God have mercy on our souls. Tell me everything you remember, I ordered Elijah. I had waited until he entered the bathroom before following and locking the door behind us. The black van was going to be there in a few hours, and my excitement was quickly being replaced with dread. I needed answers, and I needed them now. I don't know what you're talking about, he replied in a monotonous tone, forcing myself to stare into his cloudy white eyes harder than I expected. On the nights you're picked up by the shuttle service, I said, I know you've gone four times now, and I know you weren't just drinking. I want you to tell me what happened. A euphoric smile replaced his pallid countenance, then a frown, as though trying to remember the insubstantial details of a passing dream. But that's all that happened, he said. The shuttle picks us up, and they give us something to drink. Then I wake up in my home, and it's time to go to work again. And you feel just the same as you did before. The frown deepened. His eyes stretched so wide, I thought they would pop straight back out of his head. For a second, he seemed about to scream, then his face reverted back to a blank slate. It happened in such a flash that I couldn't be sure the expression was there at all, but when he smiled, 
I could sense the tension still trembling in his cheeks. Better than ever. I find it invigorating, Elijah replied. He continued staring at me in the face whilst he opened his belt and dropped his pants around his ankles. I would have liked to ask him more, but I was shocked and revolted when he began to piss in the sink right beside me. I just turned around and exited the bathroom, without another word. Whatever was being done in the building had seriously damaged these people, and it looked like there was only one way for me to find the truth. When the van arrived, my name was called alongside Wallace Thornburg, fat guy in a bulky coat and with a hat pulled lower over his face. I don't remember seeing him before today. He nodded curtly at me, but kept his distance, shoving his way into the van moments before the door slid open. Francisco, with the shuttle service, the driver announced. The driver bounced out of his seat and held the door open for me. He was dressed in the same blue suit as the guard who had escorted me before, but this man's eyes were perfectly clear. I hesitated. Where are we going? You know, the Francisco replied. I found his tone overly familiar, and my doubts redoubled. What happens if I don't want to go? But you do, the driver grinned, and put on a pair of headphones. After that, he didn't speak another word for the remainder of the drive. I climbed in, and sat on one of the two benches bolted to the metal floor on either side of the van. The fat man sat across from me, arms crossed, hat pulled lower over his face, looking like he was trying to disappear into himself. You been there before? I asked. Wouldn't remember if I did. You're not supposed to be here though. You weren't on the list. How do you know? I asked. Because I wrote the damn thing and I didn't want you to be. Of course I'm not supposed to be here either, so I won't tell if you don't. Nathan finally looked up. He grinned to see the shock on my face. Nathan did his best to explain the situation to me, as we rumbled into the secluded hills. After each of his first five rounds of procedure, his memory had been wiped clean every time. Waking up afterward felt like I was an alien in an unfamiliar world. Books, songs, people I had seen a thousand times before. They all started giving me trouble, like some sort of puzzle. I even tried to quit once, but the longer I went without another round, the more lost I felt. It became like an addiction. I couldn't live without my fix. It would have been damn irresponsible for me to keep working when I can barely tie my own shoelaces, so I requested a replacement. That's why I kept you off the list, so we could have at least one level-headed soul to keep everything running. Your wife said you put a bullet in your brain. Nathan chuckled and slid his hat further up his head. A bandage was wrapped around his temple with a great bloody spot like a Japanese flag. You blame me? I didn't think I could go on after my fifth round. And this seemed easier than having to manage without it. Next thing I know, I'm back awake and swearing like the devil. How's that for clearing your head? Worked like a charm too. I felt more like my old self than I had in years. Now I know they'd never let me walk after a stunt like that, so I let people keep believing I was gone. What are you? I knew he couldn't remember what they did, but the question slipped involuntarily from my mouth. Nathan glanced at the driver, still wearing his headphones. We were descending a sharp angle now, and must nearly be entering the valley. Nathan moved across the van to sit beside me, speaking in a hustled tone. I figure there are two possibilities. That they made me into something that isn't human, or the good lord brought me back. Either way, I figure it's my obligation to stop them from doing this to anybody else. So I switch with Wallace to throw a wrench in the cogs. Can I count on you to have my back? He caught me staring at the bloody bandage, and slid the hat back over his face. I nodded stiffly, although I hated the idea of committing myself to a war when I didn't have the first idea of who was right. It didn't seem like people were being forced here, 
but if they were being manipulated with an addictive drug, then it was just as bad. The van pulled straight past the control station, and stopped in the parking lot, where I saw the bodies being loaded last time. The hum of the drilling was omnipresent here, and my whole body vibrated like my bones were looking for a way out. The guard handed us each a pair of headphones as we parked outside the building. Wear these, it's only going to get louder inside. Nathan shifted his coat awkwardly, clutching something in his pocket with one hand, whilst he put the headphones in the other. When he said wrench, did he mean he was smuggling some kind of weapon in here? The guards didn't seem to be paying attention, and simply walked into the towering structure with us at his heels. Can you hear me okay? Francisco's voice came through the headphones. I nodded absentmindedly, walking forward in awe of the gargantuan internal structure. Three, maybe four stories tall on the outside. But it must have been built down into the abyss, because the balcony I was standing over dropped down further than I could see. In the distant depths, I thought I could make out a faint red glow but my eyes were repelled from the void by an instinctual terror that I could not overcome. Endless rows of balconies marched below me into the penumbra of shadows, each containing a massive machine with cables extended downwards into the pit. Each machine had a tether of wires extending from the other end, which connected with a helmet being worn by a man sitting beside it. There must have been hundreds of them sitting so peacefully in response that they might have been asleep, and hundreds more men in blue suits attending to the machines. What the shit? I couldn't believe my eyes. I took a step back towards the entrance, and almost tripped as I walked into something. I turned to see the guard offering me a glass of clear liquid. Nathan was already studying a second glass in his hand. You're going to drink and sit at the machine, Francisco said. When you wake up, none of this would have happened, but you're going to feel so alive that you may as well be dead now. Not remembering it and not happening are completely different things. If we ain't going to remember, you might as well tell us what's going on. The guard sighed and rolled his eyes languidly pulling a .44 Magnum handgun from his belt and playing with it in his hands. I've told you every time, Nathan, and I must admit it's getting old, and every time I've told you, you still took the drink, so why not trust me and do it again? Nathan growled and pulled his hat over to reveal the bandage. He reached inside his coat and produced a cell phone with a prominently flashing light. Well, maybe I'm not as easy to convince anymore. So why don't you humour me? Francisco calmly levelled the gun at Nathan's face, and Nathan lifted the cell to his ear. I took the opportunity to begin circling the guard, but then the magnum pointed my way and I froze. Five rounds might keep your friend alive, but how well do you think your friend will bounce back from a bullet to the face? The guard asked. Acting manager? Nathan spoke into the phone. His voice was different. I had heard that voice over the phone before. But it had been from the office of the Secretary of Defense. Put the phone down or I'll shoot. I swear to God, Nathan- Clearance code? I want you to shut down the plant the moment I give the word. Are you ready? You can't. If we have a power out, every one of these people will die. Bullshit. You're trying to save your own ass. Tell me what's really going on. He's telling the truth. It happened last time there was a power restriction too. I don't care! Nathan gripped the phone so tight his fingers turned white. Living like this. They're dead either way. I want an answer. Now. Francisco swallowed hard. He nodded. We're feeding it. If we stop, it's going to be angry. What is? I caught the guard glancing over his shoulder, and turned to look at another man in a suit, holding a rifle on the opposite balcony. Watch out, Nathan! I shouted. Put the phone down, Nathan. You have to trust me. 
the guard said. What is down there? Nathan, put it down! The guards beside us nodded sharply. A crack split the tumultuous sound of the drill, and blood sprayed from Nathan's face. The rifle bullet had punctured straight through the back of his skull, and emerged from his mouth. He looked over his shoulder in bewilderment at the man with the rifle, his whole face splitting open as he turned his head. Two more cracks from the air from the handgun. Nathan was staggered to his knees. He hadn't let go of the phone. He spat a mouthful of blood onto the floor, and rattled off a rapid sting of numbers. Another bullet slammed a hole straight through his forehead, but he didn't even hesitate. The guard lunged at Nathan, but I blocked him with my body, and we both went spinning to the ground. Authorization granted. Shut it all down. My face went numb, as the butt of the handgun slammed into my forehead. I groped the air blindly, and caught hold of the guard's suit jacket, but he ripped free and dove at Nathan. The former manager scrambled backwards, screaming into the phone the whole while. Do you hear me? My name is James Mattis. I want the whole station offline right now! The four bullets in Nathan didn't even slow him down as he scrambled away from Francisco. I locked eyes with Nathan right as he reached the edge of the balcony. Did I save them? Did I do the right thing? His voice broke, with desperation in my headphones. I pulled myself up from the floor, unable to tear my eyes away from his bloody face. You did what you thought was right, is all I could muster. Everyone held their breath, looking around at the lights and the humming machines. Connect me to the plant, tell them to keep the power! Francisco screamed into his headphones. And suddenly, the silence and the darkness were all there was. Red emergency lights flashed along the walkways for a moment, but row by row they snuffed out as the backup generators were overloaded. The lights on every balcony winked out. The hum of every machine spluttered to a stop. The vibrating pressure of the drills grinded to a halt. In the absence of all light, my eyes adjusted to see faint visible outlines from the red glare in the pit. Francisco roared with frustration and ripped his headphones off. He grabbed Nathan by the coat and rammed him against the railing. I leapt to Nathan's aid but was too slow. Nathan didn't make the least move to resist as he was tipped over the balcony to plummet into the abyss. I ran to his aid too late. The last glimpse of him I saw was a spiral of blood raining through the air in his wake. What's going to happen now? I shouted. The guard didn't answer with words, but his message was clear enough. He dropped his gun and started sprinting to the door. I should have just followed him, but I couldn't let all of this be for nothing. My feet plodded me like a moth being drawn by a flame until I could see directly over the balcony and into the abyss. Somewhere miles below the earth, where the drills once tore through the crust emanating a baleful glow, I watched transfixed as it shifted, seeming to slide from one side of the pit to the other. I turned and ran from the building. Guards, mechanical technicians, doctors, Streams of people poured from the place to fill the black vans. But the men, tethered to the machines, were being left behind. They couldn't have all been dead. I saw one slide to the ground and begin to crawl, only to be trampled beneath a stampede of men in blue. I helped the man to his feet, and dragged him out of the building with me. His lips kept moving, as though he were muttering something. But I couldn't hear it over the sounds of panicked screams and thundering footfalls. No one seemed to notice that I didn't have a blue suit in the mad escape. I crammed into one of the vans, and huddled in the back whilst it roared up the valley walls. A noisy rush of speculation surrounded me, but I was incapable of joining the conversation. 
I don't know if anyone else stayed to look like I did. But I couldn't tell them what I saw. Somehow speaking of it would make it enough to be real. We were about halfway back up the valley when a deafening explosion knocked half of us from the benches to sprawl onto the floor. The van bucked and heaved like a wild animal, but managed to stay upright as it roared down the road. There wasn't a back window, so we all had to wait along the right side until the van made a turn up to the switchback road before we saw it. The foundations of the building had been detonated, and the entire structure slid off into the pit. The man I had saved from the machine, haggard fellow, with a long beard and eyes as white as starlight, kept muttering along the rest of the drive. He was hard to look at because of all the bloody sores on his head. The helmet he was wearing had wires which plugged directly into his brain, and when I had torn him free, I had left great patches of his scalp behind. It can't die. It's already out. It's inside us all. No one else spoke along the drive, so they must have all heard him too. We all just fixed our eyes on the window though, afraid to acknowledge what we all knew. I don't know how many people had looked into the pit before they ran, but I'm sure enough of us knew that the red glow wasn't really sliding like I thought it was at first. It was opening, and from somewhere in the depths of the earth, I had looked into a colossal eye staring back at me. After the convoy of vans exited the crumbling valley, we made a stop about a mile away from the plant. I heard mention that others were continuing to a nearby army base, but six cars, mine included, peeled away from the rest. The vans parked in a sharp circle bumper to bumper, with their sliding doors all opening towards the middle. Everyone out to the van and in a circle. It was Francisco. He was holding a rifle now, prodding people as they filed out. Remove any hats, bandages and glasses. Anything which obscures your face. Nobody is leaving here until I get a chance to look into their eyes. He had been looking for signs of treatment. The bearded man I had saved was still in the back of our van with me. He looked so thin and wary. I wonder how long he'd been down there. I caught his eye, and the pure white orbs looked back with helpless pleading. We both flinched as a gunshot echoed throughout the caravan. Three more shots, one right after another. Filthy animal, just die already. Francisco said. Three of us were left in the van. The driver, the haggard man, and me. I was about to step out, when emaciated probing fingers clutched desperately at my shirt. Please help me. I only did what they told me to do. The driver pushed past us to exit in front. If it hadn't been for Nathan's interference, I would have had my first treatment today. Then... I would have been the one to be executed, assuming I hadn't already been killed when the building was detonated. These people had been strong-armed and manipulated into obeying orders, and now they were being punished by the same people who made them do it. Besides that, I still wanted more answers. By the enormity of the thing's ancient presence, I had no doubt it was still alive down there. The people who had been feeding it must have known as much as anyone what we were up against. Mankind might be diverse in our values at times, but when there is a common enemy, as calamitous as that whispers our doom, we've got no choice but to stand together against its oppression. Anyone like Francisco who sought to divide us had to be labelled as an enemy too. I saw the keys poking out of the driver's back pocket as he climbed out the van. I snatched it, applying pressure to his back to distract him. I was trying to be subtle, but he lost his balance and fell straight out of the van onto his knees. Hey, what the hell, man? The driver was loud. Too damn loud. All eyes fell on me. 
That's the guy who helped Nathan, Francisco shouted. I launched the van door shut as he was raising the rifle. The haggard man shoved me to the floor, but before I could fight him off, I heard a metallic clang of bullets punching through the door where I stood a moment before. Let's move, the bearded man said, practically flinging me through the air into the driver's seat. The van roared to life, smashing into the adjacent van to make enough space for us to escape. More bullets were raining through the walls, like a spider web of cracks filled the passenger side window. It must have been bulletproof glass, but it still wouldn't hold up for long under the assault. The pale-eyed man grunted as a bullet punched through his door and into his shoulder. The bullet seemed to barely break his skin before deflecting onto the dashboard. I present a masterpiece by Tobias Wade, and finally edging out enough room to drive. The car shot off down the road like a stone from a slingshot, the bullets rattling off the back as we went. Are you hurt? I asked the man. It'll take more than that to slow me down, so don't let them slow you down either. Not until we reach the plant. We can't stop. That's the first place they'll look. I said. They've all had their rounds, and that makes them targets now. We have to save as many as we can. How do you know about that? Who are you? Dylan, I used to be called. Doesn't seem right to call me that now though. Not much of Dylan left. We didn't have long to compare notes before I reached the plant. Two of the other vans were close on my heels the whole way. I'm not sure if we can fight them off and escape. But having a whole crew that can take bullets like vitamins seemed to be a pretty solid advantage to me. I didn't slow as we passed through the checkpoint, rammed straight through the automated gate. I didn't want to risk crossing any more open ground than I could, so I drove right through the glass door at the front of the building and parked inside. A bullet slipped by the ground near my feet the second I opened the door. I thought I had gained some ground on them. They couldn't already be here. Another bullet. This was coming from inside the building. They must have begun clearing the plant before I even got there. Dylan pulled me from the van and covered me with his body as we sprinted through the building. I saw him take two more bullets, both rattling to the ground after impact. Every room we passed was already strewn with bodies. Robert is dead. Elijah. Megan. All have been decapitated. Undergoing the treatment seemed to have given these people considerable resistance to injury and death. But there is no coming back from that. Dylan and I managed to get to the security surveillance room to see if anyone is still left. But it's only a matter of time before they find me. All of the video feeds show men in suits fanning out through the power plant. Most armed with long machetes, all stained with blood. There's nowhere left for me to go. Look, there's a few hanging on. Dylan pointed at one of the screens. Three plant workers, I didn't even have a chance to learn their names yet, were huddled in terror inside one of the supply closets. Dylan showed no hesitation, already bounding out the door as though he knew the way by heart. I started to follow but he was quick to close the door behind him. You stay hidden. I've been down there too long. There's nothing they can do to me that they haven't tried already. But you, you'll pop like a ripe melon hit by a hammer. That was vivid enough for me to stay put. I watched him on the security feed as he dashed through the hallways with inhuman speed. If you'd asked me this before this started, I would have told you that humans are the good guys and that the monsters can go to hell. Scanning the familiar workrooms and seeing the bloodbath, watching the men with machetes butchering corpses, which still struggled to move. Then, followed the trails of bloody footprints all over the building. Well, maybe there aren't any good guys here. Shit, I don't know. Maybe I'd even be better off joining Nathan and the thing in the pit. Even thinking about that felt wrong, though. The visceral terror I experienced whilst looking down into that great red eye will be enough to haunt me for the rest of my days. If I could only just get out of here though, 
I could let the whole mess of them tear each other apart and stay out of it. I was just about to make a run when the door was kicked open. Francisco stood alone with a bloody machete in each hand. His eyes were wild, looking even less human than Dylan's vacuous stare. Red handprints crawled their way around his leg, where his victims doubtlessly clutched at him before the final killing blow. I thought I'd find you here, he said his dress shoes making a wet squelch as they plodded across the room towards me. I backed up against the wall, but I was cornered. I'm still human. Nothing's been done to me. You don't have to do this. I didn't have to kill the others either. I wanted to. The moment they were plugged into those machines, they were more beasts than man. We're both men though. We're both on the same side, I said. I was throwing words that came to my mind, but nothing seemed to slow his relentless advance. I picked up the office chair and brandished it at him, but he only laughed. Think again, smart ass. I hurled the chair into the surveillance screens and watched it smash them to pieces. Francisco's smirk twisted into a snarl. I know where the others are. You won't find them without my help. Not before they escape. Fine. I'll let you live. Just tell me who's left, he growled. Not good enough. I want to know what's been going on. I want to know everything you know. There's not enough time. Then stop wasting it. He glanced at the broken monitors, then again at the long track of hallway where he came from. Francisco expelled an irritated sigh, propped the chair up and had a seat. That's when I finally got the whole story. The valley had been the result of a primal asteroid smashing into the Earth. A scientific expedition to unearth fragments resulted in the discovery of unusual movements within the lithosphere of the Earth's crust. Two tectonic plates had switched directions and were moving against the surrounding mantle, which resulted in much of the mountainous terrain in the area. The government deployed a mining expedition, looking for clues as to the build-up of pressure, and that's when they discovered it. The devil, the beast, the monster. Whatever impoverished word man had in the face of such a cataclysmic being dwelling beneath the earth, the scientists speculated that it was much too large to have been carried on the asteroid, but perhaps a seed or a hatchling had survived the journey and grown through the eons into the monstrous form that was uncovered. The mining further served to disturb the being, and its increasing activity threatened its pending escape. Nothing short of a nuclear weapon was likely to harm it, and this would be impossible to covertly detonate without radiating the surrounding groundwater and devastating the nearby population centres. The only method which seemed to slow the creature down was crudely referred to as sacrifices. The thing displayed considerable less activity after it consumed the initial miners, and subsequent experiments devised a way to feed it, via the network of machines and mental energy which I had witnessed. They had powered the machines for the last 20 years, but the sudden cease of energy seemed to have woken the creature, prompting the shaft's demolition. If there was more of the story, I didn't get a chance to hear. Francisco was getting impatient, and I didn't know how much time I could buy. Luckily, I didn't have to. Dylan returned during the recounting, and whilst Francisco's attention was still distracted, he pounced. I say pounced because only an animal could have flown through the air like that pale-eyed demon. Before Francisco could turn his head, Dylan had wrapped his thin arms around the guard's neck and snapped it like a twig. I would have been grateful if it had not been for what happened next. Dylan bit deeply into Francisco's neck, whilst his limp form was still convulsing in Dylan's arms. Even with human teeth, Dylan was able to rip out great chunks of flesh from the man, the teeth sank through the mesh of veins and arteries, crushing through the spine and straight out the other side. 
It almost took a full minute for him to gnaw his way through. I don't think he was even eating it, but simply reveling in the satisfaction of his power. I didn't say a word. I didn't look away. I just let it happen. Every time I thought I knew what I was doing, the scale of events far surpassed my expectations, and I was just left a helpless onlooker. After Dylan finished, he gave me a sloppy grin before leading me safely through the building, and it was clear which was cleanly severed with a machete, and which had been gnawed loose. Dylan had saved the three other people though, and I owed him my life as well. That's how I learnt the last part of the story that Francisco had left out. The people who were hooked to the machines, they weren't just feeding the thing. It wasn't just the human mind passing down the cables. It was also the mind of the beast passing up to them. With each round of treatment, the subjects became a little less human and a little more monstrous, until they became something like Nathan or Dylan, and couldn't live and wouldn't die. Dylan had been one of the original scientists who sacrificed himself to the creature over 20 years ago, and had voluntarily shackled himself to the machine at the time. He's right though, I shouldn't call him Dylan anymore. Dylan died a long time ago. As soon as I was out to freedom, I parted ways with the subjects. I got into my car and I drove as far and as fast as I could. As far as I know, the creature is still down there, buried beneath countless tons of rock in the hills of Colorado. I don't know whether its body is still going to try and move out or not, but I don't think it even matters. The beast thinks with Dylan's thoughts and moves with his body, like an avatar of some forgotten god. He now freely walks the earth, his zealous protection over the other subjects makes me believe that the beast's imperative is to protect his own, so I can only assume that Dylan is now working to free the creature or spread its influence by bringing more sacrifices to its underground lair. I don't know if he can be killed, and I don't know if he can be stopped. He still must feel some sense of human compassion, or he'd have never let me leave as a thanks for aiding him. So one enduring hope still remains to me, that once the beast has risen to the height of its size and power, it still finds enough room for mankind. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. What a story. It was quite challenging to put it all together, so I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. I'd like to extend a big thank you to Nature's Temper for lending his amazing voice, as well as Tobias Wade, of course, for his outstanding work. If you'd like to hear more from Nature's Temper, you'll find a link in the end of the video or in the description. And to read more from Tobias, you'll find a link in the description as well. It would mean the world to me if you would show the video some love by leaving a like and dropping a comment, as it goes a long way. And why not consider sharing it with a friend or someone who you might think will enjoy it? A story this good deserves to be shared. Wouldn't you agree? Just a reminder that you can get into the holiday spirit with my new merchandise, which can of course be found in the description, along with the links to my social media, as well as my Patreon, if you're feeling extra generous. And if you'd like me to read your story on my channel, feel free to send it to my email or share it with my Reddit which can of course be found in the description. Please make sure to include as much description and punctuation as possible to maximise the chance of your story being read. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.